On Tuesday, November 6th, 2001, Kathleen Bagby received a call no mother ever wants to receive. Her son was dead. That alone was devastating enough, but what happened next was infinitely more world-shattering. Worse yet, it was all enabled by a broken legal system that put the needs of a monster above society's most vulnerable. This is Monsters. Shirley Jane Turner was born January 28, 1961 in Wichita, Kansas. Her parents separated when she was around seven years old and she moved with her mother to the Canadian island of Newfoundland. Shirley was an incredibly gifted child when it came to academics where she regularly scored 99 and 100% on her school tests. But at home she was living in deep poverty. There was rarely enough food to go around and Shirley and her siblings often went to school hungry. Shirley was supposed to be the family's ticket out of their destitution, and her grades would easily set her up for a successful career in whichever specialty she chose. Initially, that pathway was nursing, but her friends told her that with her grades she could do better, and they encouraged her to become a doctor. In 1980, she enrolled into an undergraduate degree in chemistry at the Memorial University of Newfoundland, which is known as MUN. That would provide her a pathway into medical school. But in 1981, Shirley's studies were put aside when she decided to marry her long-term boyfriend. A year later, she gave birth to her first son. Shirley's husband stayed home to care for the boy while she continued her degree, but after a year of juggling parenting and studying, the couple decided to move to Labrador, where Shirley got a job as a science teacher. Within a year, she was pregnant again, and she gave birth to a daughter in 1985. This time, Shirley's husband went to work while Shirley was left to look after the two children. Except she used her time to look after someone else. While her husband was away, Shirley began an affair with an old lover from Newfoundland. By 1988, the marriage with her husband was over and a year later she married the new lover. The couple had a daughter in 1990, bringing Shirley's brood to two daughters and one son in her care. But just a year later, Shirley's second husband had had enough and he decided to move out. Shirley was awarded custody, but after a week she handed their infant daughter over to her ex and moved on with her life. Shirley was single and responsible for two children she had never really taken care of at the same time as trying to complete her science degree. For a while, she managed to balance the two responsibilities by relying on her second ex-husband to look after all three kids when she was studying, but the arrangement was short-lived. In October of 1993, a man who had spent time boarding with Shirley and her kids reported that he had seen her physically and emotionally abuse the two older children when they were in her care. He also reported that sometimes she would leave them alone for days on end without any food. When the report was investigated by child services, they spoke to the children who declared that they were regularly punished and hit with a belt. But when her second ex-husband was interviewed, he said that Shirley only threatened to use the belt. The case was closed in January of 1999 with no action being taken. The investigator never spoke with Shirley. By the time the child abuse investigation was done, Shirley had already moved on to bigger and better things. After a year of solo parenting, she handed the two older children back to their father and returned to university completely free of any responsibilities. She finished her Bachelor of Science and enrolled to start medical school at MUN Med in fall of 1993. Six years later, she met Andrew Bagby. Andrew David Bagby was born on September 25, 1973 in Sunnyvale, California. His parents, David and Kate, were both well regarded in their professions. Kate was a nurse practitioner who had emigrated from the United Kingdom, and David was a computer engineer and ex-Navy service member. Andrew was a much-loved and wanted child. David and Kate had been trying to get pregnant for years, but nothing worked until they tried medication in a last-ditch attempt to have the family they desired. Andrew's pregnancy was a one-time thing, and his parents accepted that he would be their only child. Andrew's early years were everything a childhood should be. His parents doted on him, he was well looked after, and he spent hours surrounded by love and nurturing from his wider family in the United States and the UK. 
Even as a child, Andrew was known as a charismatic and thoughtful person. He was the kind of kid who naturally attracted others to him, and he had a wide network of friends from a diverse range of backgrounds. He was keen to trying anything from sports to outdoor pursuits, and he was an active member of the Scouts amongst other various other extracurricular activities. But Andrew wasn't perfect. His father recalled how, for a few years, Andrew had a short temper and he was prone to expressing his emotions through his fists. David and Kate found themselves having regular talks with their son about solving his problems using dialogue rather than violence. Their thoughtful parenting worked, and by the time he was in high school, Andrew had lost any trace of the aggressiveness that had marked his earlier years, and he had grown into an easygoing and empathetic young man. After high school, Andrew set his eyes on becoming a doctor. Like Shirley, he started out with a science degree, which he completed at the University of California, Irvine. But when he applied to join a medical school, he was rejected. It was a disappointing setback, but Andrew took it in stride. He started working and assured himself that when he applied again, he would be successful. At around the same time, Andrew met Heather Arnold. After months of dating, the couple got engaged, but they decided not to set a wedding date until Andrew was sure which medical school he would be attending. In 1996, Andrew sent out over 60 applications to medical schools across the United States and Canada. His first acceptance letter came from none other than MUN Med. Heather and Andrew moved together to Newfoundland, and while his medical studies went well, their relationship didn't. Living together had made the couple realize that they were better friends than lovers, and at the end of Andrew's first year, they decided to call off the engagement. Despite the breakup, Heather and Andrew remained good friends. In fact, when Heather returned to the U.S., she stayed with David and Kate until she got back on her feet. Two years later, she enrolled at the same medical school Andrew was attending. When she entered her first year, Andrew was knee-deep in his last. And that's when he met Shirley. Looking back, it's hard to see what attracted Andrew to Shirley in the first place. She was 12 years older than him, married and divorced twice, and she had three children by two different men. Now, being a single mother shouldn't be a deterrent in the dating world. Before I got married, I dated a few single mothers. But the fact that she already had multiple divorces and had three children but no custody of any of them might have been cause for concern. Andrew had mentioned Shirley to his parents a couple of times, but whenever they asked if she was his girlfriend, he strongly denied it. He told them that Shirley had just gotten out of a long-term relationship and she wasn't looking for anything serious, just a friend to party with, and that suited Andrew just fine. He was focused on finishing his degree and getting started on his journey to become a surgeon, which was a highly competitive field. Shirley was a pleasant distraction, nothing more. What he didn't know then was that Shirley's recently ended long-term relationship was just the last in a long line of dysfunctional relationships that became downright disturbing whenever they ended. Let's go back to 1996, when Shirley began a relationship with another med student by the name of Miles Doucet. Just like with Andrew, Miles was 13 years younger than Shirley. The pair lived together for a while, but friends would often comment that the relationship was like a roller coaster. One minute they were deeply in love, the next they were fighting and screaming. On many occasions, Shirley would become so fired up that she would kick and punch Miles until she wore him down. Finally, in 1997, Miles told Shirley that the relationship was over and he moved out. After the breakup, Shirley began inundating Miles with phone calls. She would call him at all hours of the day and night. Sometimes she would hang up when he answered, and other times she would leave odd messages on his answering machine. Then she began stalking him as he went about his life. In one incident, she followed him to Halifax in Nova Scotia and hit him in the jaw with her high-heeled shoes. After that attack, Miles left Canada and moved to Pennsylvania in the United States. But the stalking didn't stop. Somehow Shirley found out where he was living and for the next year the phone calls continued. Then she started driving almost 3,000 miles or 4,800 kilometers from Newfoundland to Pennsylvania and showing up at his door without warning. She would knock and yell until Miles either answered the door or someone in the apartment building called the police. Miles notified the police on several occasions about Shirley's behavior and she was ordered to leave, but she always came back. However, the most disturbing incident was yet to come. On April 7, 1999, Miles came home to his apartment and found Shirley lying semi-conscious on his doorstep. She was draped in a black dress and she was holding a dozen roses. 
Next to her were two suicide letters. One of them was addressed to Miles, and the other was for her psychiatrist. In one of the letters, she wrote, quote, I am not evil, just sick. Miles called an ambulance, and Shirley was taken to the hospital, where they found that she had ingested 65 milligrams of over-the-counter drugs in an elaborate suicide attempt. Her stomach was pumped and she survived the incident, but the following day, Miles received a voicemail from her barely disguised voice where she told him, quote, Dr. Turner died last night. For Miles, it seemed there was nothing that could put an end to Shirley's dysfunctional interest in him. But then he was handed a lifeline. It seemed that the only thing that would stop Shirley's disturbing pursuit of Miles was her interest in someone else, Andrew. In the months after Shirley and Andrew first crossed paths, they were seen together by numerous friends and acquaintances. Nearly every one of them expressed to Andrew that Shirley was worryingly possessive and her violent mood swings were unhealthy. He also heard through the grapevine about her outbursts at various professors during her degree. But none of that seemed to put Andrew off. After all, it was a no-strings attachment and he wasn't interested in the emotional aspect of a relationship with Shirley. He would come to realize that when it came to Dr. Shirley Turner, there was no way to have one without the other. Shirley fell hard and fast for Andrew. Her 12 years of extra life and relationship experience meant she knew exactly what she wanted, and she believed Andrew was it. However, this also meant that her attachment became intense in a very short period of time. When Andrew looked like he might be pulling away or that he wasn't as interested in her as she was in him, she took a different approach to keeping him close. Shirley began to form an odd attachment to Andrew's parents. Building a relationship with David and Kate Bagby was not just an attempt to strengthen her connection with Andrew. It was also a strategy to isolate him emotionally. By getting close to his parents, Shirley was creating a cushion of trust and emotional dependency that would make it difficult for Andrew to sever ties without causing damage to the relationships he held dear. At least in her mind, that's how it would work. Psychological manipulation is a trade often observed in individuals who exhibit controlling or potentially harmful behavior in relationships. In Shirley's case, the ability to manipulate situations and people could have been an attempt to create a narrative in which she was the indispensable figure. In her mind, if Andrew ever dared to leave her, she would have his parents on her side encouraging them to get back together. The dark side of this manipulative skill is the potential to gaslight the victim into questioning their own judgments. This is a classic move in the playbook of emotional abusers, aimed at undermining the victim's self-confidence and sense of reality, making them more susceptible to control. Her actions in the months after meeting Andrew provided disturbing insight into her psyche. Even before Shirley met David and Kate face to face, she repeatedly called their house. At first, it was under the guise of wanting to talk to Andrew, but he was often not at home, so she spoke to them instead. She would tell them all about her failed marriages to men who were supposedly trying to stop her from becoming a doctor. Then she would tell them about her children who lived with their fathers. She told Kate that she had intended to go back and live near the kids once she finished with school until she found out that she could make more money in America, so she was going to move there instead. What she didn't mention was that she had no intention to ever play more than an outside role in her children's lives. Shirley didn't want the children, and she was glad she didn't have to take responsibility for their care. What would come to light many years later was that Shirley saw the children as a meal ticket. Starting in 1982, when her first child was born, Shirley had taken out baby bonuses for all of her kids. Baby bonuses in Canada are paid out to parents of newborn children to assist with child-rearing costs. In Shirley's case, she took them out under the pretext of using them to set up college funds. But instead of putting the money aside, she used it to pay for her own lifestyle. She later told relatives that she intended to earn big money as a doctor, which she would use to set up college funds for her kids. She also didn't mention to Andrew's parents that her medical school application listed her as the mother of three children. No lie there. But it also said that she maintained custody of all of them. This meant her student loans were based on being the full-time carer of three kids, which drastically reduced her liability to pay for her schooling. There were also numerous occasions during Shirley's degree when she didn't show up for classes and she used the children as her excuse. The reality was that she barely saw them at all during that time. In September of 1999, 
Andrew introduced his parents to Shirley in person for the first time. The couple were attending a wedding in California, so they stayed with Kate and David before and after the event. Shirley was much the same as she had been on the phone. She never shut up about her life, her failed marriages, or her distant relationships with her children. Three months after that visit, Shirley asked if she could come stay with David and Kate while she was in California. She told them she was taking her three kids to Disneyland. She put on a big display of being a dedicated and loving parent, but the spectacle was forced. Maybe she was trying to convince Kate and David that she would be a great partner to David and a wonderful parent to their future children. Whatever her reasons, David and Kate didn't fall for the ploy, but they played along for the kids' sake. They believed their son when he reassured them that what he had with Shirley was for a good time, not a long time. In August of 2000, Andrew graduated medical school and secured a position as a surgical resident in New York. Moving to the States put a lot of distance between him and Shirley, but they appeared to want to make a long-distance relationship work despite his assertions of it being nothing serious. But it seemed the commitment was predominantly one-sided. Shirley visited Andrew in New York seven times over the next year, while he visited her in Iowa just once. When Andrew's one-year residency was up, he moved to Latrobe, Pennsylvania to take up a family practice residence. Meanwhile, Shirley had signed on for a 10-year contract with Trimark in Sac City, Iowa. However, when Andrew told her he was moving to Pennsylvania, she walked out on her job and moved to Council Bluffs, Iowa. Three months later, in October of 2001, she purchased a Phoenix Arms HP-22 handgun and signed up for firearms lessons. On Tuesday, November 6, 2001, at 8.40 a.m., Kate received a call from Shirley while she was at work at her clinic. At first, Kate couldn't take the call because she was busy with patients, but when Shirley called again, she answered. Shirley babbled on about nothing important for a while like she normally did. She told Kate how she needed to have a shower and get changed for a work appointment at 11.30. Then she went on about how she had a migraine over the weekend and had stayed in bed and she hadn't been able to work on Monday. And then she asked if Kate had heard from Andrew lately. Kate told her that she hadn't and that she was busy and the call ended. 20 minutes later, Shirley called again. She asked Kate again if she had heard from Andrew. Again, Kate told her she hadn't because she'd been at work since the last call. Then, Shirley mentioned she had tried to reach Andrew on his phone and landline, but there had been no answer and she hadn't heard from him since Sunday. Kate hung up the phone and got back on with her work. But then there was another call from Shirley. Once again, she went on and on about information that seemed to have no relevance at the time. She told Kate that Pennsylvania State Police in Greenberg had called her boss to ask where she was on Monday when she called in sick. And then she asked Kate to page Andrew at work because she couldn't get through the switchboard operator because of something that had happened in the past. Then she went back to talking about her migraine and how she hadn't spoke to anyone except her nurse in the past two days because of it. It was only later that Kate realized what Shirley had been trying to do on those phone calls. Establish an alibi. When Kate hung up the phone for the third time, something about the phone call stuck in her mind. The words Greenberg, police, and Andrew floated across her vision, and she immediately felt ill. She knew then that something was wrong. At 2.30 p.m., Kate received a call at her work from an officer in Sunnyvale, California. He asked her to immediately call the coroner's office in Greensburg. When she finally got through, she was informed that Andrew was dead under suspicious circumstances. Kate collapsed, unable to focus, unable to think. When Kate recovered from her shock enough to hear what came next, she was told that Andrew's body had been found that morning in Keystone State Park. He had been shot to death. She immediately called David and they made plans to go to Latrobe to identify their son's body. Kate and David's only child was dead. If the story ended here, it would already be a terrible enough tragedy. A young life ended too soon, and parents left to grapple with the unthinkable void. But the story didn't stop there, and it was only going to get infinitely worse as time went on. The crime scene examination was the first part of the investigation to get underway. It yielded few significant pieces of evidence beside a single unspent round of ammunition. There was no sign of the gun used in the murder or anything else that directly implicated the killer. Next up were interviews with everyone who knew Andrew, especially those who had seen him in the hours before his body was discovered. 
Right away, Shirley's name came up and she went to the top of the suspect list. There were the friends who had cautioned Andrew about his relationship with the emotionally unstable woman and his many attempts to break it off. Then there were the colleagues who had seen him the prior morning when he mentioned her turning up unannounced and their plans to meet in the afternoon. Bit by bit, they were able to piece together a timeline of what happened in the days leading up to the murder, and it all pointed towards Shirley being responsible for his death. Things between Andrew and Shirley had been going downhill for a while. He had been clear from the start that they were only together for fun and a bit of partying, no strings attached, but Shirley wanted more. Just a few months before Andrew's murder, she had told her friends that she was ready to have another child and that she would be a better mother this time around. Oh, and she also wanted the father to be a doctor. When Shirley became too possessive even for Andrew's liking, he attempted to break things off for good. He stopped taking her calls and it appeared like he had cut her out of his life. But little by little, she weaseled her way back in. Mostly because she told Andrew she was three months pregnant with his child. On October 13th, 2001, Andrew agreed to meet with Shirley at a wedding he was attending to discuss the pregnancy and their plans going forward. By then, he had his eyes on someone else and he told Shirley he would support her with the child, but they wouldn't be a couple. Shirley was furious, both about the new woman in his life and also the fact that even a child didn't make him want her. On Saturday, November 3rd, Shirley told Andrew that she wasn't pregnant and she never had been. She had made up the pregnancy to convince him to stay with her. Andrew was understandably furious and he drove her to the local airport to put her on a flight back to Iowa. Before she left, Andrew sat Shirley down and told her in no uncertain terms that their relationship was over. For good. Shirley boarded her flight and returned home to Council Bluffs. For Andrew, it was the end of a tumultuous and emotionally taxing relationship. What he didn't know was that it was far from over in Shirley's mind. The next day, she showed up on his doorstep wanting to talk. 24 hours later, he was dead. It turns out that on the flight from Latrobe to Iowa, Shirley had made a decision. If she couldn't have Andrew, no one could. As soon as the flight touched down, she returned home and packed her RAV4 with supplies for a long drive. At 1 p.m., she started out on the 946-mile or 1,523-kilometer route from Iowa back to La Trobe. It took her 16 hours. In the early hours of Monday, November 5th, Shirley showed up on Andrew's doorstep, demanding a do-over. Andrew was on his way out the door and he told Shirley he didn't have time to discuss their relationship as he needed to get to work. Despite his better judgment, he let Shirley into the apartment and he told her they would talk when he got home that evening. When he arrived at work, Andrew told his supervisor, quote, Guess who showed up on my doorstep this morning? His supervisor was well aware of Andrew's attempts to end the relationship and he guessed correctly who the early morning visitor was. Then Andrew stated, quote, Yep, that psychotic bitch was on my doorstep. That afternoon, Andrew headed out to a satellite clinic he was working at and he told another colleague that he had arranged to meet Shirley on neutral territory at a bar. This time, he was going to end things once and for all. Again. The colleague offered to accompany Andrew for moral support, but Andrew reassured him Shirley was harmless and he promised to drop by the friend's house after the meeting. At 5pm, Andrew left the clinic, picked up a six-pack, and headed out to meet Shirley. But instead of meeting at a bar, they met in the parking lot of Keystone National Park off Route 981. A witness would later report seeing a dark sedan and an SUV parked side-by-side -side at the park at around 6pm. The description matched Andrew's Toyota Corolla and Shirley's RAV4. Just before 6 a.m. the following morning, a man found Andrew's body covered in a thin layer of frost, face down in the gravel. Andrew's autopsy revealed that he had been shot five times with a 22 caliber pistol. The first two rounds had entered the left side of his chest and his left cheek. The second had exited behind his left ear. The force of the bullets caused Andrew to spin halfway around and he fell face first into the gravel. The next two shots were delivered to Andrew's rectum. One final round was fired through the back of his head. There was also evidence that the killer had kicked Andrew in the head while he lay in the gravel. These injuries made it immediately clear to investigators that Andrew's murder had been a crime of passion. 
When officers phoned Shirley on the day Andrew's body was discovered, she answered the call in a positive and upbeat tone of voice. In fact, it took several minutes to talk to her about Andrew because she sidetracked the conversation to a number of other irrelevant topics. She talked about her accent, the quality of her telephone line, and her cell phone area code. You know, important subjects to talk about when the police call you. Finally, the officer was able to ask Shirley one critical question. When had she last spoken to Andrew? Shirley answered, Sunday. At that point in the phone call, she hadn't yet been informed about Andrew's death. But even if Shirley wasn't the killer, she had seen Andrew on Monday when she showed up at his home. I guess she just assumed he wouldn't have told anyone about that little drop-in. When the officer told Shirley that Andrew was dead, she asked, quote, Are you sure? The officer confirmed that he was 100% sure and he provided some time for Shirley to compose herself. Except she didn't really need it. She barely paused for a breath before launching into the details of her relationship with Andrew. She claimed, quote, We loved each other. We do date other people. We didn't really have a commitment. He did tell me that he had a date that Saturday when I left. Then she launched into the events of the previous few weeks, including the wedding they had attended together and the flight back to Iowa. She didn't mention that she had made up a pregnancy to get Andrew to agree to meet her. Shirley also confirmed that she hadn't left Iowa since Saturday. She had called in sick to work on Monday because of her migraine, which had improved by that night. On Tuesday morning, she drove to work as expected in time for an 11.30 appointment with a patient. Remember, that was the same morning she had called Kate at work to say she hadn't heard from Andrew since Sunday. It was looking like after killing Andrew, she had driven the 16-hour journey back to Iowa in time for work and in time to establish her alibi. When she was asked if she owned a gun, Shirley admitted that she owned a small hand pistol which would either be in her closet or in her vehicle. The officer set a time to meet with Shirley to get a formal statement and she agreed to turn over her gun for ballistics. Five hours later, Shirley rang the officer back and told him that her gun was missing. Surprise, surprise. When Shirley was interviewed, she expanded on her statement about leaving Latrobe on Saturday and not going back. Then she gave some weak excuses for where her gun could be. She said, quote, My best guess is, I can't see somebody coming into my apartment and going into my closet and knowing it was in that case and just taking the gun. I mean, I have other things here you would think somebody would steal. That is what they wanted, so my best guess would be, must have been while it was in my car. And it had on occasion been in the car for a full day and maybe even overnight by accident. I always try to lock my car. I'm really good about that as well, so I really don't have, you know, any explanation. She was also asked if she took the weapon to Latrobe for her visit, but she denied that because she couldn't have taken it on an airplane. When Shirley was asked about the nature of her relationship with Andrew, she told the officers that they weren't exclusive, but that they loved each other. But she also said they had no plans for a long-term relationship or marriage. When she was asked if Andrew had ever tried to break up with her, Shirley said, quote, Not really. She said she wasn't jealous of Andrew's new love interest and that their relationship was very mature. When the interview was over, the officer spoke to the handgun instructor who Shirley had been taking lessons from. It turned out that Shirley had already called the man and told him that her gun had gone missing and that police thought she was involved in someone's murder. The instructor was very concerned that one of his students could have been involved in a murder and he was very forthcoming with information about Shirley and her weapon. One of his statements would become critical evidence in the case. The instructor reported that the weapon Shirley used for lessons was cheap and of poor quality. One of its defining malfunctions was that it sometimes failed to feed the bullet into the chamber properly, which would cause a live, unspent round to eject onto the ground. To try to minimize that problem, Shirley had changed from American Eagle ammunition to CCI Stinger. It will probably come as no surprise that the live, unspent round found at the murder scene matched that ammunition. The day after Shirley's face-to-face -face interview, she called investigators to say that she had not been truthful the day before. She told them that she hadn't misplaced the gun and it hadn't been stolen. She had, in fact, given it to Andrew. Throughout the entire investigation, Shirley used her favorite form of communication to speak to nearly everyone involved in the case. She telephoned Andrew's friends, acquaintances, colleagues, and even his family. 
During the calls, she gave further variations on the location of the weapon. It seemed that everyone got a different version. In one, she admitted that she had seen Andrew on Monday and given him the gun. But in another call, she said she never gave Andrew the gun. That was after calling the police and admitting that she had. In another call, she admitted to seeing Andrew on Monday in the park where he was killed and handing the gun over to him. When one of the recipients of Shirley's calls asked her to clarify exactly what she meant, she stated, quote, Andrew called me and asked me to bring him the gun. He offered to buy me a plane ticket, but since a gun can't be taken on a plane, I took it to him by car. I made the drive in 12 hours and got there in the morning, but didn't give him the gun right then. I saw him again at lunch and again that evening. He put the gun in a bag in the trunk of his car. Basically, Shirley was implying that Andrew was killed by someone in the park after she handed him the gun which he had put in the trunk. Despite the varying stories put forward by Shirley and her suspicious history and strange actions since the murder, the case against her was entirely circumstantial. There was the gun, the unspent round, the visit to Latrobe, and the obvious motive of Shirley being rejected by Andrew one too many times. There was also Shirley's long history of dysfunctional behavior when it came to relationships ending as well as a history of troubling emotional outbursts when she didn't get her way during medical school. In one incident, her supervisor had to adopt a policy of never speaking to Shirley alone because of her repeated threats to lodge a formal complaint against him after he gave her a negative evaluation. There was also another worrying incident involving Andrew and Shirley recorded with the police in New York. In May of 2001, Andrew reported that his home had been burglarized and his laptop, Palm Pilot, CDs and DVDs, as well as a memento Zippo had gone missing. Because of the circumstances surrounding the incident, the investigating officer told Andrew that most likely the culprit was Shirley. Andrew didn't want to believe she was capable of such behavior, but it seems clear now that she was attempting to use the devices to spy on Andrew's social activities or potential love interests. Then there was the woman who Andrew had been seeing in the weeks before Shirley told him she was pregnant with his child. While Shirley described their relationship as mature, the woman identified Shirley's voice as being behind at least 10 messages that had been left on her work phone about Dr. Andrew Bagby. The voice warned her to stay away from him. But the break that investigators were looking for in the case was about to surface. On November 21st, Shirley's cell phone records were delivered to the police. They definitely placed her en route to Latrobe on the day before the murder and in reverse on the way home from killing Andrew. That, alongside evidence she had used her eBay login on Andrew's computer on the day of his death, cemented Shirley as being in Latrobe at the time of Andrew's murder. That same day, a warrant for her arrest was issued. But by then, Shirley was already gone. Just one week after Andrew's murder, Shirley had caught a flight to Canada and settled back into her old stomping ground in Newfoundland. On December 12th, the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary arrested Shirley on suspicion of murder in the United States. I'd like to say she was extradited to the U.S., faced trial in front of a jury of her peers, was found guilty and sentenced to a punishment befitting her crime. That's what should have happened, but imagine the exact opposite of that and you'd still be way off what actually transpired. It might be easy to assume that Canada and the United States have reciprocal extradition agreements in place, especially when it comes to murder. But what you're about to learn is that the legal landscape surrounding extradition between Canada and the United States is anything but straightforward, particularly in the early 2000s. Even in cases as severe as murder, extradition is not a simple or guaranteed process. While the legal hurdles are significant and the process is often long and slow, it would be worth it to see Shirley brought to justice. But Shirley had something else she knew would help her to escape justice for what she did to Andrew. A baby. On November 27th, she called Kate and David and told them how hard the last couple of weeks had been for her. She literally said that to the parents of her victim. Then she told them that she was six weeks pregnant with Andrew's child. It was a difficult story to believe, most obviously because she had already lied about a pregnancy before, but also because she was a compulsive liar with a lot to lose, including her freedom. Naturally, Kate and David were reluctant to believe anything Shirley had to say, but when a surveillance unit went through Shirley's trash before her arrest, they found an ultrasound printout from November 29th, which confirmed she was indeed six weeks pregnant. 
The pregnancy turned the entire case against Shirley on its head, not just for the murder of Andrew in the first place, but also in regards to her extradition to the United States. Turns out, the legal system is extra generous and considerate when there's a baby involved, but that would turn out to be a terrible, fateful bias. After Shirley was picked up by Canadian authorities and first appeared in court, the judge determined that she was not a threat to society and she should be released on bail. Except bail in Canada meant that there was no exchanging of money. All that was used to secure bail was a surety. A surety is just a promise from a person who guarantees that the accused will turn up for their next court date and if they don't, then they'll pay the determined amount. In Shirley's case, this was $75,000 Canadian. Two of Shirley's friends signed for $5,000 each. In a disturbing twist, the other $65,000 was assured by Shirley's own psychiatrist. The pair had met when Shirley was on a psychiatry rotation during her medical training. After Andrew's murder, Shirley contacted the doctor and he agreed to act as her psychiatrist. He also agreed to commit the money required for her surety. That later turned out to be a breach of the physician-doctor-patient ethics and he was found guilty of professional misconduct. For that crime, he was given a tiny fine in order to undergo counseling. That concerning defeat at the first hurdle was just a small taste of the horrors to come in this fight for justice. As Andrew's unborn child grew inside his killer, the case for Shirley's extradition waged on. Meanwhile, she got to live a life of freedom, all on the taxpayer's dime. David and Kate had decided the moment they found out about Andrew's baby that they wanted custody. They were sure that Shirley would end up locked away for good and that their son's child would need all the love and stability he could get. But first, they would need to petition the courts to approve them as caregivers. Ultimately, they decided it would be best for their case if they moved to Canada to be closer to the court proceedings and to Shirley. All they had to do then was wait for their grandchild to arrive. Zachary Andrew Turner was born on July 18, 2002. Shirley could have let the Bagbys visit the child, but through a nurse, she declared that she was too scared to let them near her baby because she was worried they would hurt him or kidnap him. That statement would soon become one of the world's biggest ironies. It was a spiteful decision and one that Shirley knew would hurt Kate and David, but it also reassured them that they were doing the right thing and applying for custody. The fact that Shirley was willing to use Zack as a pawn in her twisted emotional mind game only emphasized the urgency in getting him out of her care. On the day Zack was born, Kate and David applied for visitation. That triggered a requirement for the baby to undergo a paternity DNA test, which ultimately proved that Andrew was the father. It took until August 3rd for a hearing on whether visitation was appropriate. Finally, after much negotiation between the lawyers for both sides, an agreement was reached for the grandparents to finally have scheduled time to bond with Zach. But even then, they were only allowed to visit with him for one hour once a week, and all of their contact with him was under direct supervision from a child social worker. Oh, and Shirley demanded that they go through a full body search by a security guard before each visit, in case they were carrying anything dangerous. Meanwhile, Shirley had sole responsibility for Zach the other 167 hours of the week. On top of that, after her release on bail, one of Shirley's older daughters had come to live with her. That put her in charge of a preteen and an infant. When Child Youth and Family Services visited after the birth, they noted that the arrangement increased her stress levels and she was provided with extra social support like money, bus passes, family counseling, and arrangements for Zach to go to a foster family if it all became too much for her. David and Kate were never considered as caregivers. Despite the snub from Child Services, Andrew's parents spent as much time as they could with their grandson. He was the spitting image of his father with his reddish blonde hair and matching nose. He was a happy baby and full of smiles and he loved to be rocked and read to and snuggled, by his grandmother in particular. In September, Shirley appeared for yet another extradition hearing. That time, more detailed evidence from Andrew's murder was presented as a means to demonstrate the seriousness of the charges against Shirley in the U.S. But her lawyer dismissed the evidence and claimed the case against his client was purely circumstantial and it was not enough to warrant the removal of a Canadian citizen. His final blow came in the form of a request for discharge on the grounds that the paperwork that had been completed in the initial request for extradition was filled out incorrectly and was therefore null and void. 
If the judge agreed with that defense, then the required 90 days for filing extradition paperwork had already passed and Shirley would be free to go. Like, off the hook, completely free to go. Despite murdering somebody. Because of a paperwork error. The judge decided he needed more time to consider the validity of the paperwork and the hearing was delayed by another month. Meanwhile, the Bagbys went back to court to try and secure more time with Zack. Finally, in October, the judge determined that the paperwork was valid and another date was set to determine if Shirley should be remanded in jail to await extradition. In the meantime, Kate and David learned that Shirley had a change of heart. She had told her lawyer that if she went to jail, she wanted Zack's grandparents to have primary custody until she got bail. She also agreed to let them see Zack for two hours a week at her apartment, but still under the supervision of a social worker. It wasn't much, but it was something, and it renewed Kate and David's hope that they might still get custody of Zack when Shirley was extradited. Perhaps the most difficult part of that period, apart from having to leave Zack behind after each visit, was the fact that they had to pretend to be nice to the person they believe had murdered their son. They weren't allowed any direct contact with Shirley, but they would often see her leaving or arriving back at her apartment when they were scheduled to visit. They also knew that at any point Shirley could change her mind and they would have to go back to court to fight for visitation. On November 14th, Shirley appeared in court yet again to hear the judge's decision on whether she should be committed into custody until the decision was made about her extradition. After a lengthy explanation, the judge determined that Shirley should indeed be sent to jail. Finally, Kate and David had unhindered access to the only grandchild they would ever have. Their love for Zachary continued to grow and they relished the simple moments like watching him learn to coo and roll and giggle. But beyond the brightness he brought to their lives, a dark shadow was looming. In December, they found out that Shirley had applied for bail again. In January, a hearing got underway in front of the same judge who had set her free the first time. Shirley represented herself in court and she argued that the evidence against her in the murder case was circumstantial and that it shouldn't be considered in the decision about her extradition. But the lawyer representing the interests of the United States argued that Shirley was a flight risk and that her perceived guilt or innocence was irrelevant to the decision about extradition. If she was charged with the exact same crime in Canada with the exact same evidence, she would be kept in prison until her court date. To back up her claims that she should be let go, Shirley stated that she had been a very good person while out on bail the last time and she promised to do the same again. She reminded the judge that she had no criminal record and no record of violence so she presented no risk to anyone. The ploy worked. The judge stated that Shirley's right to be presumed innocent until proven guilty and her right to not have her liberty infringed was the deciding factor in his decision to order that she be released from jail. Just like he had mentioned the first time, the judge stated that she was at very low risk of harming anyone else. The following morning, she was released. That decision would have earth-shattering consequences. Shirley's release meant that David and Kate also had to surrender Zack back to his mother, but the transition wasn't as smooth as it had been when they had taken custody of him two months earlier. It was immediately clear that Zachary was more comfortable in the arms of his grandmother than his mother. He had become very attached to Kate in particular, who had a seemingly magical way of getting him to settle like no one else could. In fact, even caseworkers who were there to observe the visits between Zachary and his grandparents noted that he always chose them over his mother. Despite Shirley retaining full custody, David and Kate managed to secure additional visitation, and then Shirley started to offer them extra bonus visits. Sometimes she asked them to watch him while she went shopping, or on a date, or even out partying. They agreed between themselves that they would never say no to Shirley, no matter how short the notice was. They also paid for all of Zack's needs. They provided formula, food, diapers, clothing, wipes, shampoo, and car seats. Whatever Shirley asked for, Shirley got. While they tried to make the best of a terrible situation, the battle for extradition continued. There were more hearings and more attempts to use the evidence in the murder case as ammunition against extradition. But as everyone moved closer to the deadline that they all believed was coming, the time when a final decision would be made about whether Shirley would ever return to America, she became more and more manipulative towards Kate and David. She started to reduce the extra visits and she dropped hints that she would be looking for someone else to take care of Zachary if she was removed from Canada. 
Zachary had become a pawn in her game once again. At one point, she took to calling them repeatedly during their scheduled visits in an effort to spoil their time with Zach. Behind all of that was Shirley's realization that her son was more attached to Kate than to her. It was something that Shirley couldn't let slide. Over the coming months, she made snide comments about it or ignored Zach's tears as a means to punish him for daring to love somebody else. During Zach's first birthday party in July of 2003, Shirley even commented to Kate, quote, He obviously loves you more than me, so why don't you take him? By then, the hearings about Shirley's potential extradition had been delayed so many times that Kate and David had all but given up hope they would ever get justice for their son. Each postponement felt like a slap in the face and every ruling in favor of Shirley's rights felt like a complete dismissal of Andrew's murder. But nothing about this whole terrible, painful ordeal could ever have prepared them for what came next. On July 4th, 2003, Shirley began a sexual relationship with a man she met at a local bar. When he found out about Shirley's past, he broke up with her. That triggered a response almost identical to every other breakup in Shirley's past. Over the coming five weeks, she made more than 200 threatening phone calls to him. In some, she claimed to be pregnant. In others, she said she had an abortion. Then she said she had canceled the appointment and was still pregnant. She demanded the guy man up and help her with the baby. He agreed that he would pay for whatever the baby needed, but that there would be no relationship between them. Sound familiar? Eventually, the man had had enough and he told the police about the harassment. In fact, he contacted them at least three times about Shirley's behavior. However, because he refused to be identified and he didn't want to press charges, nothing was done about the reports. That was despite the fact that her behavior clearly breached the terms of her parole and would have ended her custody of Zach. At 12.45 a.m. on Monday, August 18th, 2003, Shirley drove to Conception Bay, which was where the guy she was harassing lived and worked. She drove to his workplace at the local ambulance service and inserted a picture of herself and Zach into the doorframe of an ambulance. Then she drove to his house and placed two photos and a used tampon on the front seat of his vehicle, which was parked in the driveway. One of the photos was of Zach and the other was of herself in a bra and panties. As she drove away from the house, she crashed the car into a ditch, which forced her to get out of the vehicle and walk the rest of the way to her destination. It was dark outside as Shirley made her way to the Foxtrap Marina. When she arrived, she crushed several pills of lorazepam, which she had gotten on prescription from the same psychiatrist who had bailed her out of jail. She put the crushed pills into Zach's formula and strapped her baby to her chest. Then, Shirley jumped into the Atlantic Ocean. Shirley and Zach's bodies were found on a nearby beach at around 7 p.m. that night. Kate and David were called upon once again to formally identify a loved one, this time their tiny 13-month-old grandson. It was later determined that Shirley had died by drowning while Zachary was believed to have been unconscious at the time he entered the water. The case sent shockwaves across the community. In the years since Andrew's murder, Shirley and Zachary had frequently made headlines though the conditions of Zach's custody were under a suppression order. That suppression order remained in place even after Zach's murder, but by then, David and Kate had had enough of being told what to do by the courts. If anything, in their eyes, it was the convoluted court process that had enabled the murder of their grandson in the first place. So they decided to hold a press conference in spite of the court orders barring them from doing so. Part of David's statement was, quote, We believe that Shirley Turner bears 100% of the responsibility for the murder of our son Andrew. We believe that the system helped her to kill our grandson, Zachary. Nobody will ever know exactly how Shirley Turner convinced herself that it was okay to kill a baby, anybody's baby, but particularly her own baby, and I don't care how she did that. It doesn't matter how she did that. What matters is that we knew from the record of the extradition case that she was almost certainly a monster. We knew and we can't see how the judges and lawyers involved in the extradition could not have known and still we left her free on the streets. This is a very special category of person who can set out to deliberately kill another, plan the steps to kill someone, and then carry out the plan step by step to make someone die. In October of 2006, a report into Shirley's murder-suicide was released to the public. It concluded that Zachary's death was entirely preventable. 
It was a scathing commentary on the fact that the courts had placed more importance on addressing Shirley's perceived injustices than on the safety of an innocent child. Everything pointed to the fact that social services and the Canadian courts relied heavily on the perception of Shirley's innocence rather than Zachary's welfare, the only reason she had appeared in court so far in regards to the extradition, which meant Shirley's guilt or innocence in Andrew's murder wasn't even the matter before the courts. Any murder trial would take place in Pennsylvania, and therefore her guilt or innocence was irrelevant in Canada. And yet, that's exactly the grounds that enabled her to be set free and labeled as not a threat to society. In October of 2008, a film about the case titled Dear Zachary, A Letter to a Son About His Father was released at the Slamdance Film Festival. It was written and directed by Kirk Kenny, who had been friends with Andrew since childhood. Initially, he had started to make the film to share with Zach when he was older as a way to tell him about the incredible person that his father was. It includes home videos taken when Andrew and Kurt were kids, as well as interviews with the friends and family who would form Zachary's support network as he grew up. Kurt could have never predicted that Zach wouldn't make it past his second year of life. After Zach's murder, the film became a commentary on the injustices of the so-called justice system and the many failures which enabled Zachary's murder. In 2009, the Bagbys introduced Zachary's bill to the Canadian Parliament. The intention of the bill was to allow Canadian courts to refuse bail on grounds of child protection to people accused of serious crimes. It was well received and was signed into law in December of 2010. David has since written a book about his experience titled Dance with the Devil. In the end, he determined that the only thing he could have done to prevent his grandson's death was to murder Shirley himself. But if we have to become monsters to get justice, is it really justice at all? If you're a fan of true crime, hit subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss an episode. You can also hit like or leave us a comment. You can check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our merchandise at thisismonsters.com. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.